<clears throat> I want to wish you all a very good morning. It's eight o'clock and it's wonderful to have you guys here. I want to find out if there are any ophthalmologists in the group. There are, can you guys speak up? Maybe you guys can help me with this presentation. Just all neurologists? Okay. Ophthalmology residents or anybody else interested in this, if you guys are here, just um, give a shout out when you guys join us. So um, this is a talk about the imaging. However, I thought it would be nice to start off with certain basic anatomy and then take it from there. So the learning objectives of this talk is to review the anatomy of the eye, to order the appropriate imaging study, <clears throat> to describe some imaging findings of the eye. Based on this, we can analyze the imaging findings, and if we can get to the part where we can actually make a differential diagnosis, that would be excellent. The learning outcome for this one hour talk is just to review your anatomy, um, to get your imaging protocol squared out, and to go over some of the pathology of the eye. So this is a quick review of the anatomy. Um, can you see my arrow? So when I point something, you can see it, okay. Um, so in the middle you have the biggest component is made of the vitreous. So the structures anterior to it and the structures involving it and posterior to it is how the globe of the eye is divided. So you have the lens, the ciliary body, the fibers of zonule which are connecting the ciliary body to the lens. You have the iris just in front of it and the iris is what defines the pupil. In front of the iris, you have the anterior chamber, which has the aqueous humor. You have the cornea. And posteriorly, with the vitreous body, you have three layers, which would be the retina, your choroid, and your sclera. Make note that your optic nerve head is not in the center, but the macula is. <clears throat> and the optic nerve head connects to the optic nerve. It has a sheath. You have the perioptic CSF and that would be important in making diagnosis like Thurston syndrome, right? Um, and then you have the sheath covering the whole structure. So this is just a basic anatomy. So when you talk about the segments of the globe, <clears throat> the anterior segment is anything in front of the vitreous, like I told earlier, and the posterior segment is behind it. <clears throat> so the anterior chamber has the aqueous humor. What is the purpose of it? It provides nutrition, and it also gives shape and structure to the globe. The posterior chamber is just the small one. So the vitreous is posterior segment, whereas the posterior chamber itself is just a small potential space. It is continuous with the anterior chamber through this pupil. And then you have the larger vitreous viscoelastic transparent gel. When we talk about the three layers that surround the vitreous, um, you have the retina, then you have the choroid and the sclera. When we talk about the retina, it's a multi-layered sensory neural organ. Your inner layer has the bipolar and the ganglion cells. Um, it takes care of all the sensory signals. And the outer layer is the photoreceptor cells, which is the rods and the cones. Um, and it's important to pay attention to the macula, which is the central portion. It helps with the function of daylight and color vision. And the periphery, anything other than the macula would be the night vision and motion related function. The center of the macula is the fovea, which is for high spatial resolution. Let me see if I can get my pen. The ora serrata is important because it forms the anterior margin of the retina. So when you have a retinal detachment, it is important, it is really important to pay attention where it is attached. So that's when the ora serrata becomes really important. My arrow keeps disappearing on me. Um, when it comes to the uvea, it has the three parts, which would be the choroid, uh, the ciliary body, and the iris. We briefly talked about their functions. And the outermost layer would be the sclera. And the sclera is where the various extraocular muscles are attached. It is contiguous, when you notice here, with the optic sheath posteriorly, and anteriorly, it is continuous with the cornea. It is a white layer right here. So these are the extraocular muscles. 
can someone tell me uh, instead of me just keeping on telling about anatomy which you guys already know what are the major um, some of the major extracellular muscles of the eye you guys going to talk to me or no well lateral rectus awesome and if you don't mind me telling your name, that's fine. If you don't want to yeah, tell me. Sure. Too. Zermina. Who is it again? Zermina. Zermina. Hi, Zermina. Yeah. Hi. Mm -hmm. Lateral rectus. What else? Anybody medial else? rectus. <laughs> yes, obviously, medial rectus. Then? Inferior rectus, superior rectus. Awesome. Uh, the obliques. Uh, obliques. Yeah. What what are the obliques? Uh, the inferior and superior. Okay, so lateral recti we have four, but obliques we have only two, and they covered the major ones. So there is this little flap of this red colored thing that's sticking out there. Can someone tell me what that is? It is going towards your eyelid. So Levator palpebral. Yes. Levator palpebral because it's above, it's going to be superior. There is a reason why I want to touch that anatomy too. Great. When you guys talk to me, you guys energize me. I feel like I'm not talking in a vacuum. So I really appreciate when you guys participate, okay? And it's okay to be wrong. We are here to learn. If you know everything, then I don't think I have a place here. So um, this is anatomy, right? And they nailed it. So when they say recti, it just means it's a straight muscle. So you can see how straight they are, whereas the obliques, see how you have like a little pulley effect there, the superior oblique muscle. So imaging anatomy, before we go into the anatomy itself, which is very similar to the anatomy that we saw, it's important to know how we approach it, right? So primary imaging approaches, which happens in the ophthalmologist, um, office is they do a direct fundoscopy, which would be the first line technique that they use. And they also, most clinics have a sonography, so they can actually check out the globe and what's going on. After they do this and they come up with an idea, they still sometimes need extra help. That's when they ask for all these cross-sectional modalities where the radiologist steps in, and they are mainly MR and CT. So when do we get this is a question, right? Whenever they think that they are not able to see through the pupil of the eye because it's just opaque, because either something is wrong with the vitreous or the aqueous, if it's opaque, they cannot see through. So then they need somebody else to go back and help them. And that's where the MR and CTs come into play. And for orbital evaluation, you know, if it is just involving the globe, okay, you can see, but how about the extraocular extension? It's really hard for them to see. So then, you know, sonography helps a bit, yes, but the CT and the MR gives really clear delineation. And if there's something going on with the brain in association, because you have the optic pathway, then definitely you need an MR or a CT. Having said that you need the modalities, when do we need an MR and when do we need a CT? We've been having these series of radiology talks. So what is the rule of thumb? When does one get a CT? What does it really show better than MR? And when do we get an MR which shows better than CT? Can someone say that? Or do you guys believe that always MR is better or always CT is better? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Dr. M, is this for the eyes or is this in, in general? In general, in general, because I want to tie it down for you guys so you can have a really grounded opinion of these modalities. So in general, if you want to look at it, when is CT better? So I'm, an, I'm an, a neuro intern, so I'm, I hope, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm right, but CT for bleed and then MR for like other structures. Okay, so CT for bleed, yes, she's talking from a stroke standpoint, absolutely agree. Uh, but when you lo look at just anatomy without pathology, you're talking about pathology, right, bleed. I'm asking also in a basic fundamental anatomical way, which modality shows which anatomical structure better? The MR. MR shows what anatomical structure better? All of it? Yeah, uh, for, for, yeah for brain. Yes. Okay. So the thing is, you know, when we look at generally body, we look at soft tissues and we look at bones, right? So both CT and MR shows both. 
but is one better than the other for say bone? If I want to see an orbital fracture or a skull fracture, would I get an MR or would I get a CT? Uh, I think bone is better also better for CT. Perfect, right? Yes. So bone is better for CT, nail it in your head. Next time anybody asks you when you're sleeping, you're going to say CT. So mm -hmm. if um, CT is for bone, then soft tissues are better in? M MR. MR, right? Because brain and everything, you know how clarity is so good in MR. So that is the thing. E mm -hmm. Anywhere in the body, if we are going to look at structures, like you're looking for fractures or anything, don't go get an or order an MR. That is just a basic rule of thumb. So having derived that, and you did fantastic. Intern or no intern, you are here equal and you're doing fantastic. So coming back to the orbit, if I'm looking for an orbital fracture or trauma, then I'm going to be going after CT. Yes, hemorrhage, CT will show. But hemorrhage is, is they are all pathology. To varying degrees, they show on MR also. It's just different. CT is quicker, MR is slower. In, a, in my very first talk, I brought about the differences in these two modalities and how the limitations are for each of them. So sometimes it is nice to keep remembering and retrieving them because that is where your groundwork is. So even here for trauma and everything, order a CT. But when you guys are looking for say orbital pathology, I'm looking for um, something unique, then you go for an MR. Generally speaking for orbits, a lot of times CT takes care of the problem. One, it's quicker, it's cheaper, and if you're looking for anything soft tissue like an abscess or whatever, go in for CT orbits with contrast. If you're looking for trauma or anything, go for CT orbit without contrast. There is no need to do both with and without. Can it be useful? Yeah, but the risk of it is increased radiation, which we do not want, okay? So go in for it. When do you really get an MR? A lot of times CT replaces the MR for ophthalmology structures because there are certain structures anyway you cannot see. And when we go over the anatomy, imaging anatomy, we are going to be looking at some of those. But like optic nerves and stuff like that, MR is really crisp and beautiful. And as neurologists, you guys will need to know a lot about those. So yes, that's where it plays in. So we are going to go in. And when you get an MR, it's always with and without contrast. Okay, this is another rule of thumb. When you guys get an MR, most often when you're looking for abscess or tumors or subtle inflammation, you need to see how the enhancement pattern is. You cannot just get a standalone MR with only. The only time they get it is because they got an MR without and then they want to have additional stuff and it's a short term interval follow up. So you unnecessary laying the patient down for 20, 30 minutes. So just go get an additional post contrast. That's the only time usually you get unlike a CT. OK. So in CT, choose with or without, but an MR, better to get with than without, okay? And this is just the rule of thumb. There are always exceptions. So when you guys put an order and when one of the neuroradiologists says, maybe we should do this, you know, there is a reason. Feel free to discuss with them and learn with them, okay? And uh, somebody said once, Dr. Ram said that. And my colleagues were like, what did you tell them? Because they were like challenging me on my decision. So imaging anatomy, same thing, right? We already went over the regular anatomy. So the, the imaging anatomy totally depends on what the contents are because they give me the signal, they give me the density. The root words for CT is density. It's hypodense, it's hyperdense, it's isodense. But as when you talk about MR, it's hyperintense, hypointense, isointense. And it usually goes in correlation with a particular structure that they take and it is in relation to that structure, okay? A lot of times it'll be like a muscle or it'll be like, if it's a brain pattern coming, they go in for that. So anterior segment, we already went through it. The reason I went through the anatomy is because I want you to understand why the signal looks the way it does. So aqueous chamber predominantly has fluid, right? So it has a fluid signal and fluid signal on MR is going to be what? Can someone tell me? How does your CSF look on MR? We have a lot of material to cover. You guys just want me to just keep talking? Okay, 
So in fluid, CSF is going to look dark and uh, T1 is going to look dark and T2 is going to look bright. So aqueous humor is going to follow the same signal. Whereas in, in density wise on a CT, it's going to just like look like CSF, it's just hypodense. So on a lens, it's moderately hyperdense on CT, but you know, it can change its uh, intensity on MR. So it's iso intense on T1 and hypo to fluid on T2. The ciliary body and the iris, they're usually not clearly distinguishable. <clears throat> so they don't really help with a lot of diagnostic detail. We do need the ophthalmologist. The posterior segment, the vitreous chamber, again, just like the aqueous humor. So this is uh, what kind of study? CT or an MR? CT. CT. Perfect. Okay. So this I have taken at two different cuts. So one here is the lens, right? I, I do hope you can see the arrow because I was told you can. Um, so the lens, look at the density. It is not exactly like bone, but it is dense. It is dense with respect to the fluid. So this would be a <clears throat> anterior aqueous humor. Posteriorly, you have the vitreous. It's so hard for me to even make out the posterior chamber, but it is a potential space only. Now, this is at the level of the ocular muscles. So medially, meaning closer to the midline, medially, I have the medial rectus. Laterally, I have the lateral rectus. Of course, at this part of the cut, because it's an axial image, I am not looking at the upper and the bottom. I'm looking at just this layer. So I cannot see the superior and the inferior rectus, but I can see this one nice structure in the posterior mid aspect of the um, orbit going posteriorly. What is this a structure? The neurologists love this. Optic nerve. Optic nerve. So the optic nerve, once you say that, then you find out it goes to the optic canal, which is here. But then this little crevice would be your superior orbital fissure. Okay, so different nerves go through different fissures. So when I am looking at it, I am paying attention to those. Can I always see the third nerve or anything? Not really, but if I see a mass in that region, then I will know, you know, this is what is located in this region. So maybe there is a third nerve schwannoma or a sheet tumor or whatever is going on. So know your anatomy, right? Optic, canal, orbital fissure, superior orbital fissure, optic nerve, the recti muscle, globe. And then, of course, the walls, because we talked about how CT is good. This is a soft tissue algorithm, so I have changed it in a way I can see the soft tissue density. You can acquire the algorithm as a soft tissue or bone, but after we acquire it, we can also tweak it based on the windowing and leveling. However, the resolution will be different, so it is nice to know upfront what I'm trying to do, because if it's a fracture, I definitely need my bony algorithm. Usually we do get both algorithms, a soft tissue and a bone, just to be on the safer side. And this would be the bony algorithm. See how sharp and crisp my bones are? So if I have a non-displaced fracture, it's very easy for me to pick it. So this would be my, what, what structure is this? All this air-filled thing in the middle of where the nose should be, would be my sinuses. And these would be my ethmoid sinuses. It's important to know because if there's an inflammation or infection or if there's some disruption of the bone, and if I have a soft uh, fluid collection right here, then I'm thinking an orbital abscess that has come from a sinus disease. If I see it in the inferior <clears throat> part of the orbit, then I'm thinking it's, a, it's an abscess that came from my maxillary sinus, right? So the nearby structures are as much important. And again, the optic canal, I see the orbital fissure. You're getting here into the suprasolar region. <clears throat> and you know, once it comes here, this is when you start seeing your chiasm and it goes into your optic tract. But look at this. MR is going to show your chiasm and the tract so much prettier than this because MR is good for soft tissues. This would be your coronal plane, right? It's a long, cut along the coronal suture. And here you can see the superior, inferior rectus, medial, lateral rectus, your superior oblique. Well, one of you looking at it will say, Dr. Ram, something is wrong with one of my optic nerves because one looks smaller than the other. So that's why I always keep looking at your normals because once you know your normal, then it's easy to pick the abnormal. And if I didn't know, now I'm going to say there is a little bit of fat stranding and stuff, so this must be abnormal. However, for the purpose of anatomy, so this would be your optic nerve. This is your crystal galley. You'll see your olfactory grooves, and that's where the olfactory nerves sleep. And then you have your maxillary sinus, your ethmoid sinuses. And this is your, again, your optic canal, your orbital fissure, 
um, for Raymond Rotundum, the Viridian Canal. Look at the bone algorithm, how clear all the bony detail are, and this is my soft tissue algorithm. I've not tweaked the window level, I just obtained it at that algorithm, okay? So this would be your high resolution orbital studies. So when you say I'm going to get an MR brain and you're expecting me to talk about the orbits, then I would say, why didn't I get a good history? Because I would have gotten you a dedicated orbital protocol because these are high resolution images specifically dedicated. And in that small space, I'm focusing only on the orbital structures, ocular structures and going back to the brain. I'm ignoring the rest of the brain. So the field of view is very small. So the resolution is really good. Hence, it's important for me to know exactly what you're looking for. And this, again, is a coronal plane. And look at all my muscles. So this would be, I can see some amount of enhancement in the vessel. So it's going to be post-contrast, right? And then I can see the fat is dark. So it's a fat-saturated image. So whatever is bright is going to be just the enhancing structure. This one, the fat is not saturated. It's bright. So I can also see the orbital fat is bright. It does not mean that's enhancing. Fat is here, fat is here, but see when fat is dark, when the orbital fat is suppressed, so it's dark. So these are some clues, even without anybody telling you, in your boards, if they don't tell you, and you look at a picture, how do you identify, right? So make sure to check your fat. It's a really good contrast helping agent. And then again, the superior, medial, inferior, lateral rectus, whenever you have air, Sometimes you have some artifact going on nearby. And if there was <clears throat> a fracture and somebody had done something like put a metal or whatever, then I get a little bit more susceptibility artifact on one side than the other. Then, you know, those small, small little Sherlock Holmes hat you put on and you see, but sometimes it's just air. And then you see the optic nerve. Optic nerves usually do not enhance. A little bit of enhancement can be associated with some of the vessels that supply it, nameless teeny tiny vessels. Sometimes I get this history. Can you look for central retinal artery occlusion? So far, I have I do not have a sequence here that can show me that kind of a vessel. So I cannot tell that. Okay. So you guys have to also understand the limitations of what the imaging gives us. This would be what plane is this? I know I magged it so much just to show the orbit. Can you guys make a guess? I don't know. It's a sagittal. It's so much like the picture I showed you, right? Anatomy picture. So the reason I showed the anatomy is not because you guys forgot it, but because I wanted to overlap that with my imaging. So you can say, yeah, I know all this stuff. So there is your globe and there's your lens, right? And the cornea, the anterior here, uh, chamber, right? It's dark, it's fluid and kind of the iris, ciliary body. Yeah, your guess is as good as mine. The vitreous and then my three layers right this the retina and the choroid and the sclera usually the sclera is easy to identify because it's a nice thin black line and the choroid is a vascular structure it kind of feeds everything neovascular structure so you can have a little bit brighter signal with it and the retina should be deeper to it um so the imaging recommendations, we already went through it, but also there's another way of approaching. So I took you down the pathway of anatomy, right? And then I said, we're not talking about pathology at this time. So here is a pathology. If I'm looking for something which has calcification, right? You guys know some of these tumors are calcified. It's retinoblastoma, it's hemangioblastoma. I can see it on my MR also, but then, you know, the CT is going to pick up these things better, right? So in children, usually these are childhood tumors, retinoblastoma particularly, it's very common. And then in MR, extraocular muscle um, extension, or not only muscle, but also the retrobulbar fat, the optic nerves, a lot of it is seen on MR. That's why you guys predominantly order MRI of the orbits, whereas ophthalmologists or trauma surgeons get me in my CTs. Same thing, you know, the chambers, T2 bright, uh, T1 is usually dark. A lot of times for me to evaluate these structures, you know, Sometimes I need contrast. If I'm looking for um, infection, if I'm looking for tumor, uh, if I'm looking for post-operative collections, is it an abscess? I need post-contrast imaging. That, that is again a rule of thumb. You know, whenever you see those things in any part of the body, you need contrast. And for orbits, do we have surface coils? Yes, they improve the signal and the resolution of the globe. It may be limited to evaluation of the posterior globe. Now, so far are we clear? Not even one. Yeah. 
Yes. <laughs> I was like, not even one person is clear. This is really bad. Okay. So what next. Is what? Yes, we we understand. Thank you. Okay. So pathology. Now we are going to divide it, not like how you do in an ophthalmology or in a neurology side, but from an imaging standpoint. Um, is this universal? Probably not. Is this a way that helps a lot of us decide? Yes. So I split it this way. So it's hemorrhage. Those lesions that have hemorrhage, those have calcification, those that are masses, infection, inflammation, and miscellaneous, right? Because imaging follows its own rules. So if I see something hyperdense and I'm thinking blood, because that's what I see, right? Then I need to go down a particular tree. And yes, some masses can have hemorrhages. Sometimes it can just be idiopathic trauma, um, you know, uh, whatever. Just so, you know, you we look at it based on the density or the signal changes. That's why I have come up with this. And yeah, a lot of us follow this. It's not just mine. So when it comes to hemorrhage, uh, I gave the diagnosis first, then I'm going to go into the anatomy, unlike how I do in my brain, because I just want us to be clear what we're seeing next. So uh, in a, this is a case of a post-traumatic hemorrhage, and it involves a vitreous, and we're going to walk through it together, because now we know the globe. And how come one globe is bigger than the other globe? Well, is the head a little tilted is what I want to know first. I don't think so because the sinuses look all right and I can see the carotids and I can see uh, actually the lateral orbitals. Okay, a little bit of the zygomatic arch I am seeing, which means it's a little bit tilted. So when it's tilted, I can, maybe a little bit larger globe on one side is acceptable. But I think this globe is overall way larger than the other one. So then I go scroll up and down to ensure that it is indeed larger. And I will give it to you, yes it is. And then the next key easily determinable, determinable, whatever I can determine is this central hyperdense component in the globe. And it's hard for me to really tell, is this the interchamber? Maybe it is. I don't see the lens in this cut. Does not mean the lens is not there. It's just in this cut, it's not here. But overall, I can say, yes, it is hyperdense. But it is not as dense as bone, so it's going to be hemorrhage, right? So it's some kind of a hemorrhage. As long as you say there's globe hemorrhage, good for you. It's involving the vitreous, so it's vitreous hemorrhage, great. But someone can say, is it going into the CSF and stuff? Well, we'll take it in an Angela case, but this is for a vitreous hemorrhage or globe hemorrhage. You know, maybe it's also involving the aqueous humor. So the next one is retinal detachment. When I look at retinal detachment, I look at how the retina is stretched, the leaf. Is it attached to the apex and the ora serrata? That is the key point between differentiating between a retinal and a choroidal detachment. And sometimes you can have detachments because not only because of hemorrhages, but also effusions, which are subhyaloid, and you can have exudates, right? So how is this retina attached? So you, the anterior edge we talked about, remember? So the ora serrata is right there. So one part of the retina is attached there, and then the apex is somewhere over here. So then this thin membrane gets splits out and it sticks right there. So then I'm going to call it a retinal detachment. For lack of a better word, it's like a Mercedes Benz. Nobody called it that sign. But I'm just saying to me, it looks like Mercedes Benz or a Y, letter Y. Um, and then I see this subhyaloid, which is deep to the retina, and it's uh, layering along the surface here. Well, this is for this orbit. Obviously, something is wrong with this orbit. It's a different kind of a pathology. The globe is shrunken. It has some hyperdensity. Could it be old hemorrhage layering around? Could it even have some calcification in it? This is another thing of a shrunken calcified globule called thysis bulbi. We will look at it later. But now we are looking, focusing mainly on hemorrhages. So focus on the right lobe. So the next part we talked about would be the choroidal detachment. How do we differentiate it from retinal, right? So the choroidal is lens shaped. You know, sometimes it's biconvex. Well, by concave, sometimes it can be even looking like concave or convex, but either way, it's on either side of the globe. Um, it's an ex expansion of the suprachoroidal space, which would be the space between your choroid and the sclera. It extends anteriorly from the limbus to the posterior attachment. So, you know, you have the pupil, the pupil right around the pupil is where your limbus is. So the, the serrata ends way posterior to the limbus, okay? So it looks a little bit different, see? For a choroidal detachment, it goes closer 
whereas the ora sutra just took, stopped here. And this also posteriorly didn't go to the apex, it stopped short. So the attachment, the way it attaches, brings it this appearance. But without knowing any of this, can you still quickly tell, is it a choroidal detachment? Yes, it's somewhere, it's not going to the back, it's not looking like a letter Y, it looks like a choroidal some collection, right? It's either hemorrhage or an exudate or whatever is going on. But it is causing choroidal detachment because something went into that space. So this is a picture for the limbus in, in case somebody is guessing. So, you know, it's separating between the cornea and the sclera. <clears throat> so in short, this would be the V or sometimes it looks like the Y and then here it doesn't go to the apex. Right? See how this goes more anterior and this doesn't go? So those are the two main differences. And what is this? The one on my left hand side? Which detachment is this? Retinal. Retinal. And which detachment is this? <laughs> Choroidal, the leftover. So the next one is vitreous hemorrhage. We already talked about it, but that one was more like a globe hemorrhage, which it had all of it. <clears throat> now we're going to just see that <clears throat> which involves only the vitreous. In the, it is in the posterior vitreous body where it attaches to the retina, right? Quick, simple tips. So I'm not going into the pathology and everything because you guys know this. You can refer to any book. I'm just going to give it quick tips just on imaging. So within the vitreous, you're seeing this hyperdense stuff. Now one of you or many of you, because you guys are really smart, are going to say, Dr. Ram, what if this was a tumor? I'm like, well, yeah, I agree, it could be a tumor. But you know what? If the person didn't have anything a week back or a month back, and then suddenly I'm seeing this, then definitely it has to be something new. And there's a good history, and I'm going to think about vitreous hemorrhage. But as long as it is more than the density of fluid, at least I know it's abnormal, right? So this one does have the, it is not bone and it's not calcified. Um, it does have some soft tissue or isodense hemorrhagic component. So in this case, it ended up being a vitreous hemorrhage. But see, unlike the previous globe, it's not really enlarged. The lens is fine, anterior chamber is fine. There's no global enlargement or global rupture, right? It's just focally present. And also a little bit of maybe some stranding here. See how crisp the sclera is? But this one is not quite. Some of these dots, let it go, give it some grace because they are going to be some of the vessels in there. Um, but retrobulbar fat straining <clears throat> is an important finding you need to look at. So Tursen syndrome, the neurologists are always excited about it. And I was so excited I wrote a paper on it many, many years ago. We are a number one trauma center. We see this a lot <clears throat> when compared to what you see outside. So what is Tursen syndrome? It was named after a French ophthalmologist. It's you know, vitreous or retinal hemorrhage, but the most important thing is it has subarachnoid hemorrhage because it's a continuous. Remember I told you about the CSS space between the optic nerve and the sheath, and it's important to know that space because that's how the subarachnoid hemorrhage continues into um, <clears throat> the back of the eye. So it causes a hemorrhage. <coughs> Okay, so how does a subarachnoid hemorrhage form? You know, it can be because of an aneurysm rupture, or you can have trauma and you can have subarachnoid hemorrhage. So you, you tend to have those histories. And then it indicates why is it important? Because there's rapid increase in intracranial pressure. It's also going to cause an increase in ocular pressure if this hemorrhage is going to quickly get in. Overall, there's a poor prognosis, particularly with low Glasgow coma scale. <clears throat> so this is how it looks like. It's a really pretty picture. See all this hemorrhage within the cisterns that shows an asterisk shows it and then the hemorrhage creeps in through your CSF and the surface of the optic nerve and then it gets into the globe. So this is a classic beautiful case of Tursen and it the thing is since it's connected to the brain you can see it bilaterally right it's not just one globe it's both globes. And also for what it's doing, look at how everything else looks very clean. It's not like it was a direct trauma to the orbit or to the globe, it's coming from the head. So the next one, we are going into the infection, okay? Infection, inflammation, infiltration, I just put them all together because they're all going to look in a particular way. 
I'm taking a little more time than I want because I want to make sure that you guys understand. We will have two parts. So if at any point I tend to stop, I am okay with that. I'm not expecting to finish everything I'd wanted to cover. I can go faster, but I prefer this way. Um, so the next set of diseases we'll be looking at are related to, you know, endophthalmitis and other stuff. So how do I tell it? When I'm starting to see enhancement of the choroid and retina, when there's detachment of choroid or retina, because, you know, these create exudates and stuff like that. And then when you start seeing stranding around the globe, periscleral, naturally the sclera is weeping. And for endophthalmitis, most common in um, microorganism is streptococcus pneumoniae. So there it is. Looks like an ugly globe, right? But if I really want to decipher what's going on, see, I see this exudate and I'm thinking, is it choroidal or retinal detachment? But when I'm seeing that the thing is stuck here, it is not going to the apex, then what am I thinking? Based on what we read, what kind of detachment is this? Choroidal. Choroidal. Look at you, you guys already are like neuroradiologists. <clears throat> so there is an exudate, so definitely I'm going to put it in the space after the choroid, right? So this would be subchoros, the suprahyloid space or the subchoroidal exudate. And then I see some, I see all this enhancement probably the choroid is enhancing. Then I see a little bit of enhancement more. Sometimes it's hard for me to really tell about the retina, but maybe there's some retinal enhancement too. And then things are going into the vitreous. Now, is it enhancement? Maybe it's inflammation involved, yes. If someone says, how do I know it's not hemorrhage? Then yeah, I have to look at my other sequences. This one is going to be my post-contrast sequence because I see all this enhancement going on in the brain. And I'm going to tell you it's post-contrast too. You know, all these structures are enhancing. So this tells me it's a post-contrast sequence. So this one is going to be endophthalmitis because I'm talking only about the globe. For all the stuff that's going on behind the eye, I probably need a little bit more. Maybe is there an optic nerve, a little bit of enhancement extra? Are the muscles, muscles tend to enhance normally like I showed you earlier, but are they thicker? If they're thicker, then is it some myositis also involving portions of the muscle? But when I'm talking endophthalmitis, I'm thinking only globe, okay? And another uh, microorganism is pseudomonas scleritis. So this one causes bilateral serous choroidal effusion, but this is serous, right? Thick and enhancing sclera is present. And I just wanted to give you a difference. Am I going to come and tell you guys this is streptococcal infection or pseudomonas infection? No. I'm just going to tell you I see these exudates or I'm seeing this. It's probably going to be some sort of an infection, right? And then the ophthalmologists, they are really good in all putting these together. So they know exactly what I'm talking about. And of course, now the neurologist too, right? But finding this much, we all can do, you know, in the imaging. So I'm going to stick to my turf, which would be telling, hey, I'm seeing this exudate. I'm seeing choroidal detachment. And sometimes when I don't say something, it means not that it is not there, but sometimes I may not be able to see it. We already said how we are not good in looking at iris and ciliary body sometimes, right? Anyway, so again, you see the same choroidal detachment, but this time, you know, this one is not enhancing as much. It's just an effusion right there. So this is orbital pseudotumor. Very important. Everybody's interested. So we're going to go over some of the forms. So this is, I, I gave two cases. This is an anterior form. And in this case, we're going to see uniform thickening and enhancement of the right sclera, right eyes, sclera and choroid with some fat stranding. So this is the left and this is my right. And I'm looking at this in comparison to this, see how clean and neat this is versus this is thickened. That's good enough for me to tell there's something wrong with it. And then I'm seeing all this stranding, right? So yes, it, can someone come and say it's scleritis? Sure. But also, can it be pseudotumor? Yes. Pseudotumor is not a real infection, correct? So that's why I, I lumped and I put all my inflammatory infection and infiltration together because for as a radiologist, they all fall into the same bucket for me. And yes, there is some stranding in here. So when it comes to pseudotumor, I can just see a scleral form. I can see something that involves only the optic nerve. I can see something that involves only the muscles. I can see something that involves the lacrimal gland, or I can see something that involves varying combinations of these. Okay, so in this case, I think I'm looking at the retrobulbar fat as well as the sclera. Here, so far, the muscles look good. 
And yes, it does go all the way around, right? It's not just here. Can it be patchy? Yes. Can it be diffuse? Yes. So it's all still falling under the same pseudo tumor. So this is another case. This is the relatively more common. Everybody can pick it. Everybody's excited. It's even in the radiology boards. And that is extracular muscle involvement of pseudo tumor. So this is a case where we are looking at my medial rectus, right? You guys know your rectile muscles. So my medial rectus is really enlarged, but I'm looking at the insertion. It's important to know about the insertion because this is how we tell the difference between this and Graves disease. I just want you to pay attention to this. When I'm going there, I'm going to talk about it in more detail. So there is my muscle that's enlarged and this would be, but look at this, my sclera is just fine. So it's not like I have to have all of it, but if I have it, great. If I don't, that's fine too. It's still pseudotumor. And um, for orbital pseudotumor, relatively more common is lateral rectus, but this one defied it and it was more medial rectus. Anything can form. And then it can involve, like I told, the, the various other structures. Um, this involves a tendinous insertion, unlike Graves. We're going to look at it to compare it. This is proptosis. It has painful eye moments, but it greatly improves with steroids. Graves ophthalmopathy does not really cause much of a painful eye, unlike pseudotumor. So now I'm coming to thyroid ophthalmopathy. So it causes enlargement of extracular muscles, yes, but it is mainly the belly. And hence they came up with this Coke bottle sign because the neck of it is where you're going to be your tendinous insertion. So this sparing the inter tendon is the classical case. But I also said, although it can be involved in acute cases, sometimes these diseases, they just don't follow the textbook and they make it difficult for us, right? But we can kind of hedge one or the other. So these, this is my coronal plane and this is my axial plane. And look at this, my belly is really enlarged. So if someone is like, oh, you know, maybe this is a little bit more thickened than this. Yeah, maybe, yeah, that thing keeps going. But however, there is relatively much more thickening of my belly when compared to my tendinous insertion. The more the insertion is preserved, the more I'm going to think graves, okay? And also the way in which it is formed. So in graves ophthalmopathy, you guys have heard this mnemonic, I'm slow. I'm not a big proponent of mnemonics because I forget what those letters stand for, but then sometimes some of these actually work and they stick to you. So they say, I'm slow, okay? So inferior rectus, medial rectus, I am, S, superior rectus, L, lateral rectus, okay? So it goes in this order, whereas pseudotim apparently goes in the other order, but honestly, they don't follow always the textbook. So thyroid ophthalmopathy, bilateral 75 to 90% of the time. So that is another giveaway because pseudotumor prefers to be unilateral and they can be, they are symmetrical in thyroid, right? That are uh, graves ophthalmopathy. Um, the decreasing order of frequency, and this is when I said levator palpebrae superior is remember this muscle because that can also be involved. But this is a small muscle. Sometimes it's very hard for us to see and it's in the superior most aspect of the orbit um, because it's going towards the palpebral, the, the eyelids. So, but that also gets involved in the very interior images of the coronal sections. And then remember this, I am slow. It causes proptosis. Anything can cause proptosis, which is going to increase the volume. Enlargement of the lacrimal glands is uh, also seen sometimes and it's related to lymphocytic infiltration. So, the next entity is going to be Tolesa Hunt. It's 845. So in Tolesa Hunt, uh, ipsilateral anterior cavernous sinus, it's asymmetric, it's an inflammatory change. Uh, superior orbital fissure may or may not be involved. Orbital apex may or may not be involved. We, I went through this anatomy in axial and coronal for a purpose because neurologists are really interested in the cavernous sinuses and what goes on, right? So look at this. It never looks this pretty usually. It's always a subtle finding, but when you see this, it's beautiful. So you see an enhancement, it's asymmetrical, it's involving the cavernous sinus. And is it maybe going into the um, orbital apex? Probably. But then in four months, it's like magic, it goes away with steroid treatment. The Tulsa Hunt syndrome, okay. Um, check for ICA narrowing, I put in there because it's in the region of the cavernous sinus. It does cause painful ophthalmoplegia and it's secondary to surrounding cavernous sinus inflammation. So masses, 15 minutes, maybe I can cover some of them. 
So ocular melanomas, this is one of the cases which is going to share, show a nodular mass in the choroid. And um, how do you tell? It's choroid. So this is a globe, right? The lens is not going to be sticking to the globe. Remember, the lens is floating. So do not misunderstand this for an enlarged lens or something. And besides, enlarged lens is not really a pathology too. So this is in the wall. That much we can tell, right? Is it a hemorrhage or is it an enhancement? We have to figure out. And then this is a post-contrast study because I can see a lot of enhancement and I'm telling you it's post-contrast. So something is enhancing. It's from the wall. The sclera is this outermost dark line. That's why I told that, right? And then this choroid, remember it's vascular, so it's going to be enhancing. So this thing seems to have like a choroidal tail and it's a mass involving the choroid. Melanomas are vascular lesions. They like structures with good blood flow. It's going to go to the choroid. This is a known choroidal um, ocular melanoma. So the, another case is um, an ocular melanoma where I wanted to show how on T1 certain things can be bright. We went over it in one of my first lectures to you guys about uh, basics of MR. So melanin is one of the paramagnetic substance which can cause pre-contrast increase T1. Remember the previous one I showed was enhancement after giving contrast because it's a solid vascular mass. But this one is because of its melanin component. So see, not, not, nothing in the brain enhances. This brightness is just fat because the fat is not suppressed. It's a T1 pre-contrast sequence and I can see something bright. So one, it can be hemorrhage, yes, but it can also be melanin. When it preserves everything and there's just some blood only in there, the chances are, yeah, you can happen idiopathically, sure, but then it can also be something like melanoma. It's in the differential. So the next mass is ocular metastasis. This can occur anywhere. It can be in any of those layers, including the choroid, right? And ocular metastasis, if it's vascular, it's going to cause hemorrhage, but also because a mass is going to pull and push structures, it can cause detachment. So testicular carcinoma loves to go to the orbit also, just like melanoma. So T1 post contrast, see this? This does not follow any anatomy, specifically like I can say choroidal detachment or retinal detachment. It just, whatever is present, it's pushing on all those kind of structures. But it is, this one is post contrast and it's enhancing. So this one is a metastasis. And this is another choroidal mass. And of course, the differential is again melanoma and metastasis. If it's a choroidal mass and I'm looking for this beautiful choroidal tail, okay. And choroidal hemangioma, it's a hamartoma. It's intense enhancement of the choroid. It's an angiomatous, angiomatosis of the periscleral plexus with scleral thickening, and it has some fat stranding. So watch out for those. It also has some calcified lens. These are really some of the zebras. So one of the reasons why I'm not touching the zebras is because it gets way out there. Even it's difficult for us. If someone comes and says, do you think it's going to be that? I would say, sure. But can I put in all the other inflammation infection uh, possibility in my differential? Yes. This is why I came up with the category where, you know, we put in different things into our buckets. So this is one of the common tumors. You may even get in your boards, radiology resins always get in theirs. So we used to call it the orbital hemangiomas, but now it's called the slow flow venous malformation by the new terminology. It has those cavernous spaces. It's well-defined. It's benign appearing. It's dark on T1, it's bright on T2, and it homogeneously enhances. Okay, it's a most common adult orbital vascular lesion, middle age, female, slow growing, causes proptosis. I like these lipoma dermoids because they are fatty, easy to diagnose, 100% I know I'm right. Um, so let's look at it. And for fat, the CTs are really good because you know the fatty density you can really tell. Some people confuse the fat with uh, CSF. Immediately check your um, you know, CSF go up and down. And also you can put your Hounsfield units. This is gonna be much lower. It's gonna be in minus, whereas fluid is going to be plus. It's gonna be within 10, zero to 10, whereas fat is like minus whatever, 200. And then um, if I look at my MR, if the fat is not suppressed, it's gonna be bright. If I have a fat suppressed image, it's gonna be dark. So I know it's a lipoma. Dermoids can also have fatty components, but they also tend to have calcifications and other things, right? Because they have different uh, components of the dermis and the epidermis, depending on if it's epidermoid or dermoid. 
The last tumor I'm going to touch on is orbital lymphomont, very important. It's a well-defined homogeneously enhancing mass. It pushes rather than infiltrates. This is my key, okay? It's usually extraocular, meaning outside the globe, but it can involve them also rarely. How do I tell on MR? Restricted diffusion can be present with it, just like I see in the brain. Vision is usually preserved. This is very respectful. It takes its space, but it pushes around because of its volume rather than really infiltrates. That's why a lot of times you can still have your vision. So see this, it looks big. It should be bad and ugly, but it's not. It's like kind of a gentleman. Um, so you can see the mass. It should be, all this is extra stuff. Anything extra, I'm going to call it, but it's getting close to the globe. Definitely, I think the patient can have some visual problems if it's really distorting the globe, but at this point, it's not doing any of that stuff. My optic nerve is right there, and that looks good. So in the coronal image, see how it's getting close, but it's not. So this asymmetry, by the time I'm seeing, I'm trying to decipher, is it related only to the muscle? It's outside the muscle. Is it coronal, intracoronal, extracoronal, correct? So that's another thing. So intracoronal is within the cone formed by the muscle. Conal is involving the muscle. Extraconal is outside the muscle. And sometimes these tumors, they don't respect any of these spaces. But this one is well-defined and it's a, a lymphoma. My MR, it's a homogeneously nicely enhancing mass. It's pushing things rather than infiltrating. It does appear to involve the lateral rectus muscle too. See that it's probably arising from it. So orbital lymphomas, we already talked, remember it's a non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, okay? It's painless, rarely inflammatory. Retinoblastoma, with this, hopefully it might be the last, but this is mainly a childhood tumor. Retinoblastoma is very, very important. Calcification is the big giveaway. More than 90% of them have calcification. They can be punctate, they can be speckled, they can be flocculent, they can be coalescent. But overall, they are avidly enhancing masses. You, because they are large and they are arising from the retina, retina, you can have detachment, smaller, no detachment. They can be unilateral 75% of the time. They can be bilateral because they can be related to the tumor suppressor gene, right? And they can be trilateral if they involve the pineal. They can be quadrilateral if they involve the pineal as well as the cella. For quadrilateral, it has to be the fourth tumor. Some of these, I think, are universally in boards at various levels of medical school, all the way to residency and fellowship even. So this person has a soft tissue nodule. Okay, this looks like a retinoblastoma, but then it can be other things too. However, by the time I see all these calcifications, retinoblastoma. It's a small head. It's a baby. Um, so that favors more of a retinoblastoma. This one, that was unilateral. This one is bilateral. By the time I see one in one eye completely distorting, and this is an ant mini, it's all calcified, distorting the whole globe involving it. And if I see you in a speck of calcification on the other one, I'm going to be worried about bilateral. And then on MR, this is another patient. It looks like nice soft tissue masses, bilateral. And then this is another patient, which look at these two globes, definitely involved. Now there's a third one. So I'm not going to ignore the eyes when I'm looking at my cellar supracellar tumors, particularly when I'm looking at kids, okay? So when I'm seeing this, I'm having the, the third tumor. But if I'm also having one of the midline tumors, okay, when you have two guys and one midline, it's going to be a trilateral. When you have two eyes and one midline followed by a second midline, it's going to be quadrilateral. A lot of times the third ends up being a pineoblastoma. And this is in the region of the pineal gland. It is enhancing cystic solid tumor. And then you can also have one in the cella suprasola. So that's retinoblastoma. So we're doing, going to do a quick recall. We have six minutes to go. So case one, you guys want to give me a shout out? Oh my God, you're nailing these things. You're not even thinking. So what kind of study is this? First of all, modality. What modality is it? CT or MR? MR. Perfect. So tell me the modality because sometimes it's not all going to be simple, right? Then we need to figure it out back pedal. Cool. The choroidal detachment. You know this, so I'm not even going to go over it. Case two. What modality is this? It's a CT. Okay. Um, it's 
so the medial rectus tumor. Medial rectus, okay. Uh, so we are going to use the word tumor. Like the Coke bottle on, um, that's the orbital. <laughs> with the, sorry. That's cool. First of all, don't use the word tumor randomly because we use the word lesion, we use a mass and all this differently. This is the reason because one of the, the Coke bottle thing is also not a tumor. The other one is also not a tumor technically, right? So we are going to say enlargement or something like that. Enlarged medial rectus muscle, right? Okay, go on. So if the muscle is involved, we came across two of them. One is What are the things that causes proptosis and the uh, endocrinologist is very excited about? The, the Graves arbitography. Yes, Graves. And the other one that is a fake is a pseudo. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, sorry, forgot. Yeah, it's a pseudo tumor. You said tumor, right? So it's a pseudo tumor. It pretends to be a tumor, but it's not. It's an inflammatory disease, right? So pseudotumor and uh, Graves ophthalmopathy will be a differential. And like you said, yes, uh, Coke bottle, which means if the ins tendinous insertion is intact, then it's going to be Graves. If it is involved, it's going to be pseudotumor. Now, um, this one is Coke bottle and it's Graves ophthalmopathy. And we also talked about me being slow, I'm slow. So inferior rectus is also involved. This is also enlarged. Medial rectus is also involved may be involved, but lateral rectus is not. Usually, pseudotumor, if they're going to give you an antimony, they try to give you with a lateral rectus. Good job, and thanks for taking a risk, you know. Jumping in is like putting yourself out there, and it takes a lot of guts to get out there. Third case. I think this is our last case. So, anyone want to jump in? What modality is this? The top two belong to the same modality. Bottom two. Different modality. Is this a CT or an MR? CT. CT. The bottom one is? Uh, the MR. Perfect. And in CT, I'm going to go and look, and I'm seeing this calcification, and it's involving a lot of the globe, and there's, I don't know whether you can see my whole picture, or you guys are all over the, oh, Yeah, we can, we can see the pictures. Okay, because all the, the Teams thing is hanging on there for me. So it's bilateral, and I can see the calcification, and I see the distorted globe, and I'm describing it to you, because when you guys describe, the diagnosis will pop in your head. That's why I always say description itself was one of my objective, like you should be able to describe. So it's bilateral, involving the globe. It's got calcification. It looks relatively limited to the globe. It looks like it's a child. What right. should it be? Blastoma. There you go. So I didn't tell it, but I described it. And I want you guys to describe it because by the time you finish describing, either you'll have a question as to what else you want or you will have an answer already. So we went to the final level where you not only gave me a differential, but you actually nailed the diagnosis. Do you guys have any questions so far that we covered? We have two minutes. Okay, if you guys have no questions, I want you to just shout out one new thing that you learned. Coke bottle sign. Yay! Oh, you guys love the sign, man. I did too when I was young. And then I realized not all signs work. But yes, Coke bottle sign. What else? I, you can <laughs> go ahead if you want. Yeah. What was that? I, I had no idea about Tursen syndrome. Uh, so that was new to me. Appreciate yeah. it. Tursen syndrome is very important. Please remember that because it changes prognosis of patient. Awesome. What else? And orbital pseudotumor, to be honest, that we I haven't heard enough about that. Okay. Because that's a major differential, um, even for you guys. Other voices? I, some voices are never heard. They need to be heard. You guys need to learn to participate. Come on. I want new voices. You guys are really shy, you know. They're recording, but I'm not going to ask anybody's name anymore, so nobody will know who's talking. And it's okay to be wrong. So it's 9 o'clock. I know everybody needs to get back to work, so I'm going to say 
we are going to stop with this, but then there's another part. I know you guys are so interested in learning about the optic nerve. So I wanted to give a due diligence, but I wanted to have this anatomy and all these basics kind of little packed in. And there are certain other things that I've left, you know, things like PHPV, which is more like ophthalmology related. They will be more excited than you guys. I might touch a little bit so you guys might know. Um, some of you might even do fundoscopy exams. So you can teach me too. But uh, we will touch base on it in another lecture. So if you guys have no questions, then until we meet again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah,